Great, sounds good. Thank you. Great, great. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. I'm uh, Charles Shearhart. I work for Andrea Young at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Really sorry I can't be there today. Um, so it, I'm going to tell you today about some phenomena that we observe in intrinsic Trinity studies. So just to give you a general overview of what uh, we're capable of in our lab, uh, the main uh, thing that I work on uh, that is a unique capability is this nano squid magnetometry. So we have uh, ways of taking cold quartz micropipettes, uh, which are tubes with very, uh, very thin holes in the tips and evaporating superconductors on, onto uh, the tip from a few different angles to form a squid at the tip. So that allows us to use this sharp needle with a squid on the end as a scanning pro magnetometer and take 2D images of the magnetic field above a device. And so this has a couple of hundred nanometers spatial resolution. Uh, in uh, most cases, uh, our, our best resolution is uh, down to a few tens of nanometers. So most of the systems today I'm going to be talking about are moray super lattices. Probably many of you are familiar with those, but just to remind you, if you take two 2D crystals and either twist them or uh, use two crystals with different lattice constants, you can produce a super lattice with a much larger lattice constant than either of the two constituent crystals. And that's illustrated right here. So that has a variety of interesting, uh, inter interesting capabilities. So it's possible to electrostatically gate these systems and also they have uh, a variety of properties that are uh, interesting to study. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to be talking pretty much exclusively about uh, churn magnets. Uh, so these uh, are. Excuse me. Are, excuse me. Uh, sorry for the yep. interruption. I think the, there's some big noise now. We can, we can hear big noise. I think there's a problem in my Oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me. Is it still there? Can you hear me now? Yeah, no, it's, it's much better. Okay, thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, yes. You can. Is that better? Yeah, yeah. It's much better. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, please Great. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. I. I. Uh, yeah. It must be my headset. Uh, sorry about that. Um. Right. So today I'll be talking about a variety of different phenomena in uh, intrinsic turn magnets and turn insulators. Uh, I'm going to start by introducing twisted bilayer graphene, which is the first intrinsic turn insulator that we found uh, or, or that we encountered. Uh, and then I'm going to be talking about twisted monolayer bilayer graphene and AB aligned lipid thyroid tungsten selenide. So, uh, in our lab, we primarily focus on these exfoliated crystals. So, what we'll do is we'll take a 2D uh, a, a, a system that has much weaker bonds out of plane than in plane. We'll put it on a piece of tape, we'll fold it, fold it over many times and then ultimately end up with a, uh, a one or few atom thick 2D crystal. So the easiest thing we can do at that point is put some contacts on there and then run current through it and then measure resistances and Hall resistances and tran other transport properties as a function of um, magnetic field or temperature or whatever we're interested in. So the other thing we can do is park our squid above this system and then raster, uh, raster over it, measuring the local magnetic field. And that allows us to simultaneously measure the transport properties and whatever magnetic structure or texture is, is currently present in this system. So I discussed earlier uh, briefly how we make these nanosquid tips. Uh, what I'm showing right here is the magnetic field response of one of these nanosquids. As you can see, there is a periodic response in the critical current as a function of magnetic field. And we can use that to detect the local magnetic field right at the tip. We can also, uh, we also press a tuning fork against the tip and vibrate it, which allows us to do simultaneous AFM. And that allows us to easily navigate around these, these fragile 2D heterostructures, um, both for uh, understanding topography and for keeping the squid safe while imaging. Right, so uh, as has been discussed in many other talks, uh, the, it's, it's often easy uh, to calculate the 2D, the band structure of these 2D crystals and compare to experiment. In systems like graphene, it agrees quite well. Uh, and all of these systems have some, uh, or, or graphene in particular and many of these other systems have uh, degeneracy associated with spin or some other 
a local degree of freedom, right? Uh, so in, whenever you have that situation, exchange interactions can produce a displacement of one of the spin subbands relative to the other. And if they're strong enough, they can gap out one band and produce, produce a magnetic insulator. So uh, this is a spontaneously broken symmetry in, uh, in magnetic systems. Uh, in the case of a ferromagnetic system, this spontaneously broken symmetry can be controlled by applying a magnetic field, which changes the magnetization of the system. So in all of these cases uh, that I've shown so far, the system doesn't change qualitatively very much when you execute this uh, orbit in phase space, when you apply a magnetic field and repolarize the magnet. In all cases, it's, it's a, a, a band insulator with a spontaneously broken symmetry. The only evidence that you would see that anything is changing about the system is if you were able to pro magnetization. Right? So I'm going to show you an example of such a system. Uh, it's, it doesn't have uh, any topological properties or invariants like we've been discussing, uh, but I think it's useful as a starting point and to show you the capabilities of the nanosquid microscope. So this system is chromium iodide. Uh, it is a exfoliatable 2D magnet. Uh, it has out of plane antiferromagnetic interactions and in plane ferromagnetic interactions. Uh, so, in the monolayer limit, it is a ferromagnet. So, what I'm showing here is a four layer chromium iodide flake undergoing an antiferromagnet to ferromagnet phase transition. There's an optical image of this region on the right, and on the left, you can see the nanosquid. This image was taken with about an 80 nanometer tip. So, it's about an 80 nanometer resolution image of the magnetic environment above the chromium iodide flake. And as you can see, there's some magnetic texture that's changing as a function of progress through this magnetic phase transition. So that brings us to the question of what's interesting about magnetic insulators, right? So this chromium iodide system, it has a, a Curie temperature of a few tens of Kelvin. It's an insulator. Uh, there's not very much that you can do with it other than uh, measure its magnetic properties. And that brings us to this topological invariant known as the churn number. Uh, and I think this has been talked uh, about at, at uh, extreme length in a lot of other talks. But to summarize, uh, this is an, a property of a band uh, which guarantees the existence of a, a set of quantum states in the gap between a pair of churn bands. These states are localized at the edge. In uh, a churn insulator, which has chiral edge states, the states can only move in one direction. So an electron placed in this quantum state has finite angular momentum or equivalently, it moves along the edge and can support transport currents just like a metal would. Right, so the magnetization in a churn insulator dominates the transport properties of the system. So in your trivial magnetic insulator, you can there is a spontaneously broken symmetry, which is the magnetization, but that doesn't couple to transport in any particularly interesting way. The magnetic churn insulator, the sign of the churn number is determined by this spontaneously broken symmetry. And the direction that the electrons go along the edge of the sample is determined by the churn number. So if you execute a magnetic hysteresis loop, you will see that the churn number of the filled states change, and that will have an impact on the transport properties. Right, so the churn number is something like the total number of quantum states at the Fermi level. Uh, so as you go to higher churn numbers, you will see additional quantum states available to Fermi level associated with uh, this topological invariant. Um, in a metal, right, because there is a, a, a near continuum of states uh, close in momentum uh, to whatever block state you want to pick, uh, the system supports dissipation of electrical currents, dissipation of energy and momentum. Uh, in a churn insulator state, there isn't this set of states that are, that, are, uh, that are close to whichever block state is populated, right, to, to, to execute uh, a scattering event, the electron would have to move all the way to the other side of the device and change its momentum. So these systems do not support backscattering and thus don't support dissipation once an electron is in the edge state. Right, so uh, the final interesting transport property of these, these churn magnets is uh, that the Hall resistance is quantized. So it's also true that the two terminal resistance is quantized. This comes from the this uh, landauer butteker picture of transport through single quantum channels. Uh, I'm not going to get too deep into it here, but it's very simple. The general point is that you get this conductance quantum uh, for each uh, quantum state, delocalized quantum state that's available. Uh, and because the direction 
of the, because the chirality of the edge state is determined by this turn number, which is abrupt spontaneously broken symmetry, you have a fall resistance, uh, which is the voltage across a device that has current flowing through it, which is a spontaneously broken symmetry as well. So that follows the magnetization. So putting this all together, we get something known as the quantum anomalous fall effect. So this, uh, in summary, is a situation in which the Hall resistance is quantized and is a spontaneously broken symmetry and has a magnetic hysteresis loop, just like the magnetization of the system. Right. So uh, that's sort of a summary of generally what is uh, meant when, when uh, a experimentalist says that they have found a churn insulator or a churn magnet. Uh, and in short, it was a summary of the transport properties of these systems. And generally, the focus of this talk today is going to be uh, on a set of other properties that these systems have that are also interesting and that we can explore with the squid, and in, in particular with the squid combined with transport. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to focus on some of the ways that synthetic, so-called synthetic churn insulators are different from these intrinsic churn insulators, right? So, so what do I mean by synthetic churn insulator? So, um, Early in the days of the study of these systems, theoretically, there were a variety of proposals for realizing them in experiment. And the first one that ultimately succeeded was this so-called so magnetic doping idea. And the, the idea there was to take a 3D topological insulator, make a very, very thin film of it, and add magnetic dopants. So sort of extrinsically turn the system in, into one that has strong exchange interactions, thereby realizing a churn insulator. So the idea here is that you start with churn bands, uh, add your magnetic dopants, which are not incorporated into the lattice, and realize a quantum anomalous hall effect. And this was very successful. So there are a variety of different groups now that have replicated quantum anomalous hall effects in a variety of magnetically doped uh, 3D topological insulators in the thin film limit. Right. So uh, that is an approach with a lot of advantages, but it also is also an approach that has some limitations. And I think the, the, the one that people were most aware of at the time was this, I, this fact that the magnetic dopants that were realizing magnetism in these systems are not ordered, right? They're, they represent a very strong disorder potential uh, off of which electrons can scatter and they can reduce the activation gap for electrons in these states. So there, is, there are ways of being quantitative about what I just said. Uh, so I think the simplest one is a comparison of the energy scale of magnetism to charge transport, right? So if you think about a pair of churn bands, when you promote an electron from the valence to the conduction band, that represents both a, a charge excitation and also a magnetic excitation, right? So that requires a spin flip. Um, and uh, that means that at best, the magnetic, the energy scale for a magnetic excitation should be uh, at least as low as the energy scale of a charge excitation. But actually, it's even lower because magnetic excitations uh, can come in different forms than charge excitations, right? So magnetic, uh, the magnetic degrees of freedom also have access to magnons. Uh, the spins can cant, which generally is, is costs less energy than promoting an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. And that means that, generally speaking, you expect the energy scale of magnetic excitations, something like the Curie temperature or the Nael temperature for an antiferromagnet, to be smaller than the energy scale of the charge gap. And this is something that is easy to probe in an experiment and is very sensitive to disorder. So if you have a situation where the local Fermi level is varying a lot as a function of position in the device, that will only reduce the charge gap without redu reducing the Curie temperature. And in particular, these doped TIs uh, had the opposite limit from the one I just described. They had a situation in which the Curie temperature was very high, uh, indicating that magnetism was very robust, but the churn magnet gap was very low, only a couple of Kelvin, uh, which indicates that uh, the, the, the local disorder potential was very strong relative to the gap. So the opposite situation, uh, the other way to realize a churn insulator is one in which a pair of churn bands doesn't depend on magnetic dopants to realize magnetism. It's one in which exchange interactions themselves uh, gap out one of the churn bands. Um, so uh, this uh, was realized uh, in twisted bilayer graphene by 
uh, David Goldhaber Gordon's group at Stanford and also by our group. Uh, and in this system, uh, we see quantization all the way up to a couple of Kelvin. Uh, and indeed, we see quantization that is limited by the Curie temperature and not by the, the gap. The churn magnets gap is about 25 Kelvin in this system, but the Curie temperature was only about seven Kelvin. We measure the, the, the charge gap with thermal excitation. So this represents a realization of the clean limit of a churn insulator. Uh, and, and is thus a resolution of this issue with, with doped TIs. But the thing that I want to point out uh, in particular in this talk is that there are other advantages to, to, to an intrinsic approach to realizing a quantum anomalous Hall effect, to realizing a churn magnet, right? There are things that are special about intrinsic churn insulators other than the fact that they don't have the strong disorder potential from the magnetic dopants. So the first indication that this was the case was that it, we found that in every intrinsic churn insulator we studied, so on the top is shown twisted bilayer, the bottom is twisted monolayer bilayer, which is a related system, uh, also graphene. There is extremely strong coupling between transport currents uh, and indeed transport properties and, ex and current and gate excursions. So chemical potential and, and uh, uh, charge flow through the device both couple extremely strongly to magnetism in the sense that they can flip it. So uh, this is something that in twisted bilayer graphene, we were surprised to find and didn't fully understand and to some extent still don't fully understand. Um, in twisted monolayer bilayer graphene, it's something we understood a little bit better and it's intimately related to the fact that there exist these chiral edge states and, and that's the, what I'm gonna discuss here. So to start with, I think many people are familiar with these Moray super lattices, but I've just shown an example of a pair of hexagonal lattices superimposed with a finite twist angle and shown where the electrons would go to realize one electron per unit cell filling. So in a system like twisted bilayer graphene, uh, if there is an exchange gap at one electron per unit cell, this is something like what the crystal would probably look like in real space. So the first system I'm gonna talk about uh, is this twisted bilayer graphene system. Uh, on the left, I've shown uh, approximately to scale what the magic angle twisted bilayer graphene moray super lattice looks like. Uh, the unit cell is a little bit more than 10 nanometers. Uh, and these systems are uh, all uh, bilayer or bilayers or trilayers encapsulated in boron nitride with a graphite bottom gate. So all of those steps are important for realizing low disorder systems. And an optical image of this device, is that right? So there's another thing that's worth mentioning about graphene in particular before we go on. Graphene has an additional degeneracy uh, beyond spin. So the graphene bands also have this valley degeneracy that comes from uh, the sublattice uh, in uh, the graphene unit cell. Uh, so there are these two atoms that are related by inversion symmetry, uh, and this produces the valley, so-called valley degeneracy in uh, graphene. And because of these two twofold degeneracies, the moray uh, bands uh, and indeed the graphene bands are fourfold degenerate. Right? So on the x-axis, uh, I'm showing you density of electrons in the Moray super lattice that I just showed you. On the y-axis, I'm showing resistance. At full filling, which is four electrons per unit cell, uh, and full depletion, we see large gaps. At three electrons per unit cell, we also see a dramatic drop in RxX uh, and a quantization of the Hall resistance. And this is this quantum anomalous Hall state that I've been discussing. So you can take a magnetic hysteresis loop as a function of electron density. So this is sort of zoomed in around that peak that I just showed you. And indeed, you, and you can measure the Hall resistance in that regime. And indeed we see this, this magnetic hysteresis loop of the Hall resistance with good quantization uh, for positive and negative uh, magnetic field. So this is uh, one of the magnetic hysteresis loops showing the Hall resistance on the left and the temperature dependence is on the right. I discussed earlier the significance of the Curie temperature and the turn magnet gap comparison. Um, but mostly I just wanted to show this as a, uh, an example of a system that we can measure in transport and also measure in squid and uh, to introduce some of the ideas that I'm gonna talk about for twisted monolayer violet graphene. Right, so uh, probably uh, an, an idea that might be familiar to some of, of you that study to these 2D magnets is that every every uniform distribution of magnet magnetization in 2D can be represented in the sense that its mag magnetic field can be uh, represented as a 
magnetic field from the Biot's of artifacts of an edge current, right? So this is usually presented right in, in your, uh, your physics textbook as a way of calculating the magnetic field distribution around a 2D magnet, right? But it is also, uh, it is also useful for justifying the claim that a chiral edge state also represents a contribution to the magnetization, right? So every time that your system has a chiral edge state that is populated with electrons, that also, uh, that is equivalent to saying that your system has a contribution to its magnetization uh, that is generated by those, those chiral edge states. And indeed, uh, the analogy is, uh, is uh, you know, can be carried forward to say that when you change the churn number of your system, the sign of that magnetization changes as well. So uh, that doesn't, uh, of course, that, that is of course consistent with the fact that there are other contributions to the magnetization, of course, uh, most, to, you know, magnetic systems uh, correspond to some uh, microscopic spin texture, so the spins are all aligned or canted in some direction relative to each other, and that produces some net magnetic moment or, and, and distribution of magnetization, and that's what produces a bulk um, magnetic moment. And if you want to understand the total magnetization of a 2D crystal, you need to, uh, you need to account for both of these contributions. So if you have a 2D magnetic system with a finite churn number, you will have some magnetization contributed by spin and some magnetization contributed by this chiral edge state for a total magnetization that is different from either. So uh, unlike uh, a spin magnetization inside of an exchange gap, as you add electrons, as you change the chemical potential, you will be adding additional contributions to the magnetization because you will be adding electrons to a quantum state uh, and it's easy to calculate this contribution to the magnetization. It's just, it depends only on the churn number, uh, the size of the gap, and some physical constants. So this is something that we can probe directly with the squid. I'm not going to get too deep into this paper. You can read it right here. Uh, but the main point is that we can easily see in twisted bilayer graphene that this system is in kind of a unique limit in that the dominant source of magnetization is the chiral edge state. So the, the magnetization contributed by spin and the, the non-topological orbital magnetic moment is relatively small compared to the chiral edge state's contribution to the magnetization. So uh, I, I just talked about twisted bilayer graphene, which is in probably the limit uh, that is most convenient to think about, which is a situation in which you have some spin polarization or orbital, pol orbital magnetization that is then accompanied by a chiral edge state which as you fill it strengthens the magnetization because you're adding electrons that increase the total magnetic moment relative to the spin magnetization. Now, uh, it's important to point out that there's nothing in the description I just gave you that guarantees, guarantees that the chiral edge state contribution to the magnetization is aligned with the spin magnetization or the non-topological magnetization, right? So the other situation in which the chiral edge state magnetization is anti-aligned with the spin magnetization or the orbital magnetization is also possible in principle. So in this situation, as you add electrons in the, into the chiral edge state, you would be reducing the total magnetization of the system. Oops. So uh, that uh, is a property of one of the churn insulators in this twisted monolayer bilayer gra uh, graphene system. And it has a ton of interesting consequences. So this system is a little bit different from twisted bilayer. Uh, it's a churn two system, not a churn one system, but a lot of the qualitative properties in terms of transport and how we work with the system are, are similar. So uh, what I'm showing you on the left is a plot of the magnetization of the ground state as a function of electron density. So in a situation where you have a, a uh, chiral edge state, you have a gap, but you haven't filled the chiral edge state yet, you'll have purely a spin or a non-topological magnetization, an orbital magnetization uh, without a uh, chiral contribution. And then as you add electrons, you will reduce the magnetization. And if the chiral magnetization contribution is large enough, you can change the sign of the magnetiz magnetization associated with each symmetry broken ground state, right? And uh, if you do that, uh, then you will change what the ground state is at finite magnetic field. So if you have a ground state that is spin up, 
you populate your chiral, chiral edge states, you switch the sign of the magnetization, you will end up with the spin down uh, state as the ground state. And we can see that in the anomalous fall resistance as a function of electron density uh, and as a function of magnetic field. So on this side, we see this positive anomalous fall resistance change to a negative anomalous fall resistance across this boundary where the magnetization passes through zero. This is also a first order phase transition. So we can park our electron density and magnetic field at a particular value, a pair of values, and, and execute magnetic hysteresis loops along both axes, along magnetic field and electron density, uh, and realize a flippable uh, magnetic bit using this, this topological effect that we've been discussing. All right, so this is showing you the anomalous fall resistance uh, as a function, you know, in a, in a time series that involves both excursions in magnetic field and electron density. So this system, um, of course, is not very different in principle from these proximitized turn magnets, from these doped films of, of uh, topological insulators. But the important difference is these, the presence of these uh, magnetic dopants. So because the surface is sprinkled with these, uh, these magnetic dopants with very high magnetization, the contribution of the chiral edge state to the total magnetiza magnetization is very small and isn't nearly enough to overwhelm the magnetization of the, of the total magnetization of the system. Whereas in twisted monolayer bilayer graphene, because it's an intrinsic turn insulator with a small total magnetization, the chiral edge state's contribution can be can be dominant and indeed can, can change the sign of the total magnetization. Right, so the point here is that uh, a bunch of fairly simple properties of a turn insulator have all come together here to realize a, uh, a phenomenon both in transport and in magnetic properties that give us an electrically readable, electrically writable uh, magnetic bit with nominally dissipationless transport. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about a few other systems, but the point here I think I want to emphasize is that uh, this is something that uh, would be hard to realize without an intrinsic turn insulator, right? With, with a system that had an exchange gap that was uh, set by a higher energy scale than the, uh, the, the turn insulator itself. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is a different system. This is AB-aligned molybdenum telluride tungsten selenide. Uh, it is also an exfoliated heterostructure. Uh, what I'm showing it right is the anomalous fall resistance as a function of magnetic field. So you can see that we have quantization of the anomalous fall resistance. This is also a churn one system, uh, and we have a small magnetic hysteresis loop. Uh, and this is from Kinfai Mock and Jay Sean's group. So, um, this is also different from the previous systems that I've discussed in that it isn't graphene. It's based on these transition metal dichalcogenide systems. So these have a bunch of heavy transition metals bonded to uh, chalcogenides and together form this uh, uh, the lattice shown here. Uh, another difference is that in twisted bilayer, one of the uh, interesting things that you can do with a a uh, pair of graphene lattices is treat the twist angle as a variational parameter to mi minimize bandwidth. That's not what's going on here. The bandwidth is set entirely by uh, just the properties of the system. The goal here is to align the lattices with each other and realize a hetero bilayer uh, moray super lattice. So have two different lattices that are aligned with each other and thereby realize moray super lattice. So on the left, I'm showing you an optical image of the, the device that we'll be talking about. So it looks a little strange uh, for uh, reasons that are easy to understand. The, the uh, system that I'm talking about is a tungsten selenide and molybdenum telluride heterobilayer. The molybdenum telluride is air sensitive, which means these devices are fabricated in a glove box and encapsulated in boron nitride. The way that contact is made to them is contacts are deposited first onto a piece of BN. Uh, and then the device is placed on top, uh, and then another piece of BN is placed on top. So the idea then is that the contacts themselves are encapsulated in boron nitride, and that's sort of why they look dark relative to the background. So I've, I've uh, shown an optical image of the device that has overlap of the molybdenum thyride tungsten selenide in both gates, including the four contacts where with uh, the transport data that I'll be showing. Uh, on the right, you can see a schematic of where the molybdenum telluride and the tungsten selenide 
flakes are and also the, where the top gate is. So I'm showing you two terminal transport as a function of uh, electron density and displacement field. So uh, you can see uh, that for one, one sign of doping, uh, we don't see any conductance at all. Uh, that's probably not because uh, the system is uh, totally insulating. It's probably more a property of the contact. So these TMD systems are notoriously difficult to contact. Um, at one hole per unit cell, you can see that there is an exchange gap uh, that opens up over a pretty wide range of displacement fields. And indeed, also at two holes per unit cell, you can see the super lattice gap. Right? So this is coming from uh, full filling or full depletion of the Moray band. This is indeed an exchange gap. And a point that's worth mentioning, I think, is that uh, this system uh, at one hole per unit cell at low displacement field is not topological. It's a trivial system, but it's a very high energy exchange gap. It's it's uh, uh, well over 100 Kelvin, a wide variety of these TMD systems. And that's sort of uh, just a point that's worth remembering uh, in the context of uh, realizing these systems at higher energy scale, right? So this is not a system in which we've minimized the bandwidth uh, in order to realize some very fragile state at low temperature. It's a system that has a fairly large uh, uh, exchange gap driven by fairly strong interactions. Uh, and in, in that sense is not particularly a flat band phenomenon. So anyway, so uh, the TMD, lat uh, the heterobilar lattice is shown approximately to scale uh, on the bottom left. These systems uh, have both a bottom gate and a top gate. Uh, one of the advantages of the squid over other scanning probe microscopy techniques is that we can see right through the top gate, right? So there's no meaningful screening of the magnetic field by the graphite top gate, which means that we can easily see what's going on inside. So uh, I'm now showing that same data on the left uh, in the top gate and bottom gate axes. Uh, and I'm showing a region zoomed in uh, around uh, the bottom of the left plot, but showing anomalous fall resistance. So you can see that right after the closure of uh, the exchange gap at one hole per unit cell, there is a large increase in the anomalous fall resistance. And the color axis here is in units of von Klitzing constant. So indeed, you can see that we're reaching quantization in this regime. So I'm going to zoom in on that regime. Uh, and indeed, you can see realization of uh, a quantized anomalous fall effect here. I've shown a line cut through here so that you can see, see us reaching uh, quantization of the anomalous fall resistance uh, in more detail. Uh, and uh, we can park the electron density and displacement field right in that regime and do a magnetic hysteresis loop. So you can see that at a couple of hundred millitesla, we realize a quantized anomalous fall resistance. And at very, very low field, we, we have a, a magnetic hysteresis loop, although we don't see quantization at zero field. So um, the next thing that we can do is use this nanosquid tool uh, to image the magnetic order. So what we're doing is we're applying an AC voltage to the bottom gate. Uh, we're uh, keeping a DC voltage in the top gate, and we're measuring the AC magnetic field associated with the excitation applied to the bottom gate. So that gives us something like the derivative in magnetic field as a function of uh, bottom gate. So we're going to start by parking the squid at one particular point in this device and then taking a phase diagram with this uh, magnetic contrast mechanism the same time as we take a, a phase diagram in the anomalous hall resistance. So you can see um, that uh, in the regime where we see a quantized anomalous hall resistance at relatively small field, we also see the emergence of magnetic order. So we see uh, in this regime a positive derivative of B with respect to bottom gate and then a negative derivative of B with respect to bottom gate. So what's going on here is a magnetic is a magnet is growing in magnetization and then dropping in magnetization. So uh, the next thing we can do is use our local probe to uh, probe the uh, magnetic order over the entire device. Uh, so I'm going to park the top and bottom gate voltage right here and then scan over the regime that shows quantum anomalous hall between the contacts. Uh, and this is what we see in that regime. So as you can see, the system is not very uniform. There is only a modestly sized patch of material that shows magnetism, but indeed it does separate these four contacts that we used for the quantum anomalous hall measurement. So uh, magnetic contrast is useful uh, for 
for a lot of, it has a lot of advantages over something like electrometry or STM. You know, I, I discussed the fact that we can see through top gates earlier. Uh, one of the significant disadvantages that it has is that it's non-local, right? So uh, not only is the machine that we're imaging not precisely magnetic field, it's the derivative of magnetic field. It's also true that the magnetic field is not monotonic even in magnetization, right? So the uh, ma the local magnetic field is a pretty rich function of the distribution of magnetization around the sample. So if you want to reconstruct magnetization uh, from this data set, you need to take a, a video and integrate it and then invert it to get magnetization. So I'm gonna show you that video. Uh, so what you're seeing is dBdV as a function of bottom gate voltage through this quantization plateau. So the next thing we can do is integrate that to get magnetic field. And finally, we can invert that to get magnetization. So I'll just show you one last time the uh, anomalous Hall resistance uh, and the magnetization simultaneously. So you can see that uh, as we uh, as we tune through the quantum anomalous Hall peak, uh, we can see the magnetization appear and then subsequently disappear. Right, so all of that was uh, uh, interesting, but those are properties of churn insulators that we more or less expected or, or already knew about, right? So uh, the main point of this section of the talk is actually a, a new set of phenomena uh, that we studied in this system. So uh, many of these interaction-driven phases have critical currents or have some threshold current at which they're degraded. Uh, these quantum anomalous Hall systems, these churn magnets are no different. There is a uh, current uh, or voltage bias threshold at which we see degradation of the uh, the quantization of the anomalous Hall resistance, and we see increases in RxX. Uh, and in that regime, we understand electronic currents to be moving into the vault uh, through a variety of, of different mechanisms that have been proposed. So in this particular system, as we go from a, a few tens of nanoamps up to a few hundreds of nanoamps, we see the quantization reduced to a factor of two below the, the that expected from uh, uh, the conflicting constant. Um, so uh, we wanted to study th this regime using both uh, the our, our uh, transport data and also squid magnetometry. So there's a couple of different contrast mechanisms I'll be showing you here. One is a differential resistance, uh, which is measured in transport. So we're applying a DC plus AC current. Uh, the other contrast mechanism is something similar, but with the squid. So we'll be applying a DC plus AC current and measuring the local magnetic field at that frequency. So if the current is coupling to magnetic corner uh, in terms of destroying it or flipping it, we'll see that locally with the squid. So this is the transport data through the quantum anomalous Hall plateau uh, as a function of bottom gate. On the y-axis, I'm showing you DC current. So we're applying a DC plus small AC current. And a lot of this is pretty much expected, right? So as you increase current, you see degradation of the two terminal resistance. So currents are entering the bulk, which reduces the total resistance of the system. There are a couple of things that are interesting. Uh, and I think the main one is that there's this sharp feature at finite critical current where we see something changing suddenly uh, as a function of DC current. So the question is, uh, is there a way for us to study what's going on here with the squid? So we're going to park the DC plus AC current right here, and we're going to take 2D images in the quantum anomalous Hall plateau. So this is what we see with the squid. So uh, this is the region right between these four contacts that show quantization of the anomalous Hall resistance. Uh, and as we flow current from bottom to top, uh, we see uh, switching of the local magnetic order on one side. And as we, uh, when we flip the direction of current, we see switching of local magnetization on the opposite side of the device. So what's happening is uh, in, in phase with the applied current, the local magnetic order is flipping. So we can park our squid right over these, these features uh, and then measure as a function of uh, DC current and bottom gate, the uh, squid response. Uh, 
This is shown on the right side of this plot for both current directions. We can overlay that with the transport data, and we see that, that the transport data is closely associated with this local magnetic switching phenomenon. Right. Uh, this is also something that we can see in the DC data, and indeed, uh, it is a first order phase transition. So uh, what's going on is there is a magnetic domain that is being nucleated by DC current in this regime on one side of the device transverse to the applied current. And this is something that we can flip controllably with excursions and DC current. So a hysteresis loop is shown on left, and then uh, flipping of the bit as a function of time is shown on the right. So just to summarize the phenomenon, what's going on is uh, as we flow current from bottom to top of the device, we have this magnetic domain that's stabilized uh, on one side transverse to the flow of current. As we flow current in the opposite direction, we have a magnetic domain stabilized uh, on the tran opposite transverse side. So uh, the question you know, arises, what's, what's going on here uh, isn't exactly what we expected uh, from the twisted bilayer graphene data. Uh, and we have a couple of ideas that I'm going to go over, go over uh, next. So uh, there are a few different pictures of what can be going, going on in this quantum anomalous Hall breakdown regime. I think the, uh, the simplest one, in my opinion, is to just understand it in analogy to the quantum Hall effect. So the quantum Hall effect also has this current-driven breakdown uh, regime, where as you flow a large current through your chiral edge state, eventually current spills into the bulk, and you, you realize a system with, without quantized anomalous Hall resistance. And in that picture, what's going on is as you apply a voltage, eventually you apply so large a voltage that the, there is a substantial difference in, in chemical potential on different sides of the device. And if that difference becomes large enough, you'll eventually populate the next churn band, the next Landau level, uh, with the local bias potential. And once you hit that regime, you'll start populating electrons in the conduction band, and you'll have metallic behavior, or, or you'll have electrons spilling into the bulk. So I think we can understand something like that as going on in this quantum anomalous Hall effect. The idea there is that instead of populating the next Landau level with your finite bias, you're populating the other churn band with your finite bias, in which case, your quantum anomalous Hall system is now acting like a, a doped semiconductor with electrons flowing through the bulk. So uh, this is something that is known in other semiconductors, in, in particular non-topological ones. What I'm showing at left is a spin Hall effect in gallium arsenide. So uh, when you flow electrons through this semiconductor, there is a finite anomalous velocity associated with, with uh, the Berry curvature and electrons of different spin end up on different sides of the device. So this is a, a spin hall effect in a semiconducting system. So of course, also metallic systems with finite Berry curvature will have spin hall effects uh, and will do the same thing. Um, we'll have anomalous velocity and we'll do the same thing. And uh, there's a, 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 a cottage industry of using this phenomenon, the accumulation of spin on opposite sides of the device uh, in response to a transport current in the presence of, of strong Berry curvature to realize magnetic bits. So what I'm showing at right is what's known as a spin orbit torque bit. So what's going on is electrons are flowing through the tantalum, which has this spin Hall effect. Electrons flow of opposite spin, flow to different sides of the device, and a magnet has been attached to one side of the device and it can be flipped with this, this local enrichment in the spin population. We think what's going on in this quantum anomalous Hall system is something like that. So the idea is that electrons that are injected into the quantum anomalous Hall system enter a chiral edge state. Uh, under most circumstances, they stay in the chiral edge state. However, if electrons are allowed to enter the bulk, either because of this high bias effect or at finite temperature, or a temperature close to the, to the activation, enter, you know, the activation uh, gap, uh, then you'll have electrons in the bulk that are experiencing this enormous anomalous velocity associated with the the Berry curvature that's giving you your quantum anomalous Hall effect. And when that happens, you'll, you'll accumulate spin of opposite uh, sign, opposite orientation on opposite sides of the device. On one side of the device, the spins will be happy. They'll be the same orientation as the background magnetization. But on the other side, they will exert a torque on the magnetization as they relax. Eventually, uh, that torque will be so large that you'll locally flip the magnetization. So uh, that brings us to uh, the end of that phenomenon. Uh, I've discussed uh, already some of the phenomenon that we find in these intrinsic turn insulators. In twisted bilayer graphene, we saw that small excursions in current 
uh, can, can flip the magnetization, uh, the bulk magnetization. In twisted monolayer bilayer graphene, we saw that small excursions in electron density uh, or in chemical potential can flip the magnetization as a result of the population of these chiral edge states uh, with additional electrons and, and, and the coupling of that to the total magnetization. And in this molybdenum tar tungsten selenide system, we've seen how electrons that enter the bulk uh, have anomalous velocities they pick up from the Berry phase, from the Berry curvature, and accumulate on opposite sides of the device, uh, and, and thus uh, flip the magnetization. Um, and uh, as before, I, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, all of this is happening because the magnetization contributed by spin, contributed by, or contributed by other channels like, like magnetic dopants, is modest relative to the magnetization of the bands themselves. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, as long as you avoid the limit where the magnetization uh, is dominated by magnetic dopants or by some higher energy scale than is producing the exchange gap of your magnetic turn insulator, uh, these phenomena should be general, right? So you should see spin hall torques and uh, for turn minus one ground states, switchability of the magnetization through coupling to the chiral edge states uh, in any turn insulator, in any, any turn magnet. Um, so the next question, uh, when discussing technologies, uh, excuse, me, excuse me, I think you have only yeah, go ahead. Two, two, three minutes, including the discussion. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I'm almost done. So, uh, of course, all of these systems are limited in energy scale, right? So the, the highest Curie temperature churn magnet that we've realized was this twisted bilayer graphene system, uh, which survived up to, uh, uh, six or seven Kelvin. This twisted monolayer bilayer graphene is pretty similar in energy scale. The new equals three state that shows that switching survives through six or seven Kelvin. And the twisted or the aligned and lumentari tungsten selenide only survives to around two or three Kelvin. Right. So I think a point that I, I think is worth making is that none of that, uh, as far as I know, is intrinsic to the physics that I've been discussing. Right. So magnetism itself is a very high energy phenomenon. Uh, there are all kinds of transition metal magnets that survive up above a thousand Kelvin. Uh, and indeed, room temperature 2D ferromagnetism has already been observed in a, a couple of different systems now, but originally in this iron germanium telluride system, uh, which is shown here. Um, and of course, uh, as most people here probably know, there's no intrinsic energy scale to topology. It's just a property of a band. And indeed, uh, room temperature chiral edge states have already been observed in, uh, in graphene and high magnetic field in, in a quantum Hall state, right? So although it remains true that the highest uh, Curie temperature churn magnets are around five Kelvin, uh, maybe six or seven Kelvin generously, there's not really any reason to expect that very high temperature churn insulators might be realized in, uh, in other systems, perhaps even outside of Moray super lattices. Uh, and in that limit, uh, these phenomena should uh, allow electronic control of magnetism uh, in a pretty wide variety of systems. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank my uh, my coworkers and collaborators. Uh, Evgeny Redikov was uh, 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 instrumental in the molybdenum tar tungsten selenide work. Marek Serlin was a, a close associate of mine building the nanosquid. Gregory Polshin uh, was responsible for fabricating uh, several of the devices here. And then our coworkers or our collaborators at Cornell, uh, Ken Feimach and Jay Shan's group, we're responsible for making this molybdenum tarite tungsten selenide device that I showed some data today. And then lastly, I'd like to put in a plug for, for my uh, friend and longtime coworker, Gregory Polshin. He recently started a lab at IST Austria, and he's uh, uh, in the market for graduate students and postdocs. Uh, and I think he's a, an excellent scientist and uh, was an important contributor uh, in almost everything I talked about today. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. So now the talk is open for question. Any question? So yeah, so let, let me ask a very simple question. You already may mention that you, you can distinguish the the spin contribution of magnetization and also orbital contribution of magnetization. Could you, could you, I mean, uh, uh, could you explain again? I mean, how how you actually distinguish the, the, these two contributions in the experiment? 
Yeah, so it's uh, there are some systems in which this is much easier than others. Uh -huh. So uh, molybdenum tarite, tungsten selenide, that class of systems, these exfoliated TMDs, uh -huh. they're 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 2D semiconductors that couple very strongly to light. Uh -huh. And there's a variety of optical probes that can probe uh, spin polarization independently of the topological magnetization. Uh -huh. So that's uh, in that particular system. It's easy to convolute, con deconvolute the two contributions for that reason. The other mechanism uh, through which we can deconvolute them is just uh, their behavior in the gap. So for a, a, a simple trivial mod insulator uh, with an exchange gap that is you know, has ferromagnetic interactions, once you enter the gap and you have an insulator, you don't expect any change in either the electron density or the shape of the wave function. Right, so you don't actually expect to add any electrons in the gap, whereas for a churn insulator, you're adding uh, electrons continuously in the gap, and those electrons are coupling to magnetization. So in principle, any change in the magnetization that you see in the gap, uh, where you see these this quantized anomalous fault resistance, you can attribute to the chiral edge states. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So yes, yeah, Okasa. So, So I have a question about the mechanism of the domain flip to the current. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think you mentioned that uh, when the electric field is strong, uh, there will be some uh, electrons populating the, uh, the empty band, the bands which were originally empty, that have uh, opposite uh, uh, churn number or spin churn number, and the spin will flow in the opposite direction and uh, it will accumulate at the edge and uh, start flipping the domains. Is this description correct? Or what is this the way that you explain it? I think that's more or less my understanding. Uh, I, uh, a, a piece of information that we have that I didn't put in the talk uh, is that we can image the spin hall effect in this system outside the quantum anomalous hall regime. So what you're seeing here is a 2D scan of the same region uh, showing local magnetic field associated with an AC current. Uh, and you can see that, and, and to be clear, AC currents will generate magnetic field from the Biotz of artifact, but uh, much smaller than we would be sensitive to here. So any local magnetic field is associated with spin accumulation. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of a phase diagram. That, uh, it's the same axes as I showed in the transport data earlier. And this region is where we see flipping, right? Uh, this is the quantum anomalous fall regime, but over a wide variety of regions close to uh, full filling of the Hubbard band, so close to one hole per unit cell, we see a large increase in the spin hall, which we understand to be associated with, you know, a, a populating electrons into states with large Berry curvature and anomalous velocity. So, in, so mechanism is correct. Is there a threshold for this to happen? Like. Uh, when you increase the electric field, initially it doesn't happen, but uh, uh, there's... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so that, that I was calling that the critical current, uh -huh. but uh, it's happening, on, as these plots on the right show you uh, as a function of DC current, uh, where we see this sort of local spin flipping, magnetization flipping phenomenon. <clears throat> and indeed it doesn't, in most regimes, it doesn't happen at zero bias current. It's a, a situation where you have a finite critical current or critical bias, uh, and then it happens when there's enough spin accumulation. Okay. And maybe it's possible that if you combine this experiment with uh, some optical experiment where you can ex photo excite the carriers to this other band, then this threshold will become very small or even zero. I think uh, <clears throat> so. I think my understanding of, uh, well, first of all, one way that you could do what you're saying is just to go to high temperature, oh. right? And then and then have uh, charge carriers in the other turn band just thermally. Um, that's an experiment we didn't do in this in this in this system for basically uh, technical reasons. The squid we were using had a too small a, a, a critical temperature to image in that regime, <clears throat> but it's more or less. It might be what's going on in twisted bilayer graphene. So twisted bilayer graphene also shows this current switching phenomenon, and it might be that 
uh, because we were measuring at six Kelvin, which is, you know, probably enough, you know, a high enough temperature to get some electrons into the bulk that we were exerting a torque with those bulk electrons. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I think time is up. So uh, let's thank the speaker, speaker again. Thank you very much.